Thank you, Christopher. Our next speaker is Rock Clark, a highly acclaimed fiction writer who has published five books, including three novels and two collections of short stories. In these works, Clark has taken on a number of literary challenges, including the daunting task of attempting metafiction in his second novel, An Arsonist's Guide to Writers' Homes in New England. Based on the novel's prolonged appearance on the national bestseller list, it's safe to say that his attempt was an overwhelming success. Brock Clark's stories and essays have been published by the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the New England Review, the Southern Review, and among many others. He has also received numerous awards, including the Mary McCarthy Prize for Fiction, the Prairie Schooner Book Series Prize, a National Endowments for the Arts Fellowship, and an Ohio Council for the Arts Fellowship. We can all look forward to the upcoming publication of his sixth book, a novel entitled The Happiest People in the World, in November. Until then, please join me in welcoming Brock Clark. This is an incredibly long walk. It's like I'm walking the Green Mile here. Um, <laughs> So good to be here. I, I'm actually from, I was telling Jennifer earlier, I'm from a small town called Little Falls, about an hour from here, and Colgate always served as this sort of mythical thing in my imagination, like of who I might be in the future when I was a better, smarter human being. And uh, I went on a tour here when I was 17, and I remember I went to the cafeteria, and these two guys saw the tour, and then commenced to do this sort of fake vomiting routine that lasted for like 30 seconds, like an incredibly long bout of fake vomiting, and I thought, I would really like it here if only they would let me in, um, <laughs> which they did not. <laughs> this is, I'm going to read from, it's so great to read with Chris. We have been friends for a long time, so this is, uh, this is great. Um, I'm going to read from this new book that's coming out in November called The Happiest People in the World, and I, I don't want to say too much about it. The, the only thing maybe that you should probably know is that, uh, there, you probably know this already, these Danish cartoonists were asked to draw cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad as they saw him, and uh, several of them did and this caused uh, the expected. And one of them, um, well, several of them were, went to hiding. And I decided, what if I had a cartoonist, a dumb cartoonist, who drew a cartoon commenting upon the cartoons, and then was, someone tried to kill him, and he decided to fake his own death and go underground, and then emerge in upstate New York under an assumed name as a guidance counselor. Because, you know, that's what, I, that's what you would do. Uh, and so that's, this, that's what I've done for 300 odd pages. Um, I'm going to read from three chapters in the middle uh, of the novel. The cartoonist's name is uh, Jens Badrup, but his assumed name, his fake name, is Henry Larson. And I think that's it. Oh, he's, uh, he's, he's decided to, he slept with his boss's wife, who then leaves his boss, and he's about to marry then this woman uh, in the pages I'm about to read. Yeah, that's it. And it's, a, it's set in a town called Broomville, which is my very clever way of disguising the fact that it's actually based in a town called Boonville, which is about an hour <laughs> north of here. Just before, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah thanks. Just before three o'clock, Henry looked up and saw a stout, dark-bearded, sleepy-eyed man standing in the doorway. On the door, which was open, was a sign that read, Mr. Larson, Guidance Counselor. On the other side of the cramped room was a metal desk, and on the other side of that was Henry himself. The stranger looked at the sign on the door and smirked. Then, still smirking, he looked at Henry's face, and most carefully, too, like he was committing it to memory, like a traveler m might have read an itinerary, which, of course, in Henry's case, would have said Skane, then Copenhagen, Stockholm, Oslo, St. Petersburg, Paris, London, and so on and so on, until finally here, in his office at the Broomville Junior Senior High School in Broomville, New York. Larson, the man finally said, that's a Danish name. Oh, Henry's pretending to be Swedish. <laughs> In response, Henry did by what now came naturally. He frowned. Because this is what you did as his patient or student or whatever you called the person who came to see the guidance counselor. You uttered a declarative sentence. And this is what he did as your guidance counselor. He frowned to let you know that he disapproved of the inaccuracy of your declaration. Whereupon you tried again. This was Henry's method, for which he was famous throughout the school and into the town of Broomville, too, a declarative sentence that, had he heard it, would not have caused him to frown. In fact, just before the stranger appeared, Henry had sat down with Pete Schuyler, a crooked-toothed tenth grader who had just gotten into a fist fight after the football game against Lowville the Friday before. It was Monday, and the cut below Pete's eye, left eye was still raw, still glistening with ooze. 
The fight had been with a senior at Lowville High, and when Henry asked Pete about the reason for the fight, Pete said, because he was a retard farmer. Henry just frowned in response, and Pete must have known he would, as most anyone in Broomville would have known he would. If you're from Lowville, then you're automatically a retard farmer, Pete protested. Everyone knows this. It's just common knowledge. <laughs> Henry frowned at that, too. He knew he was locally famous for his frown, for his method, and he didn't mind, because after all, he had been internationally famous for something else, and that he had minded. That he still minded. Larson, that's a Danish name, the stranger had said a few seconds earlier. The stranger then repeated the statement, but before Henry could respond again with his famous frown, someone said, Mr. L? A second later, Jenny Talent stepped into the office. As usual, everything about Jenny seemed to be wrong on purpose. Her hair was cut lopsidedly and dyed a color somewhere between red wine and mud. Her pants were black and baggy, and off of one of the belt loops hung a chain that wasn't attached to anything. She was wearing a heavy, oversized, black hooded jacket, even though it was an unusually warm October afternoon. There were two strings hanging from the jacket on either side of her neck, and one of them was considerably longer than the other, and looked wet. Henry guessed that Jenny had been sucking on it, again. Her ears weren't pierced, nor was her nose, nor either of her eyebrows or her lips, but there was a metal rivet lodged in the left side of her neck, at the center of a tattooed bullseye. The bullseye and the rivet seemed to do something to the stranger. He got up, and without saying any last thing to Henry, or any first thing to the girl, walked briskly out of the office. Who is that guy? Jenny asked. Normally her bullseye and rivet spooked him too, but just now Henry didn't think he'd ever been so relieved to see anyone in his life. Help me, Henry said to Jenny in his mind. Shut up, he said to himself in the same place. He'd been telling himself to shut up for two years since he first moved to Broomville. That he'd managed to do so was a major part of his happiness, not to mention his method. I don't know, Henry told Jenny, and before she could ask him any more questions, he said, what's going on? Principal Clock, that's Maddie, the, yeah. Uh, Principal Clock sent me to tell you, baseball. She said baseball, the way the stranger had said Danish. Larson, that's a Danish name. The stranger had said it twice, the first time he'd spoken in Danish, and the second in English, even though Henry had understood the Danish perfectly well. Baseball meant that it was time again for the annual student-faculty baseball game. Henry had never completely understood why this game took place during football season, nor, <laughs> nor why it was called a student-faculty baseball game when the only students who played in the game were already on the baseball and softball teams, and the only faculty who played were the faculty who coached baseball or softball. The only thing that made sense about the game was that everyone, students, faculty, staff, was required to go to it. In the case of an out-of-season, inaptly named student-faculty baseball game, you had to require attendance if you wanted people to attend. The game had already started by the time Henry and Jenny arrived. Jenny went to lean against the fence with the other kids who dressed like something was wrong with them. Henry went to sit next to Dr. This is going to be annoying, I apologize. Henry went, went to sit by Dr. Vernon, who was sitting by himself halfway up the bleachers. He was wearing a blue and yellow Hawaiian shirt with parrots perched on either end of a branch. The branch was supposed to span the shirt wearer's pectorals, but Dr. Vernon was hunched over in such a way that it looked as though the parrot were feasting on his nipples. <laughs> Hello, Henry, Dr. Vernon. Dr. Vernon, his first name was Barry, but no one at the school ever called him anything but Dr. Vernon with the italics, was the school's long-term sub. If you went to Broomville Junior Senior High School, then sooner or later Dr. Vernon would be your long-term sub, but he would never be your regular teacher because even though he supposedly, had his doctorate in something or other, he couldn't be bothered to get his teacher's certificate. He was that kind of guy. <laughs> Sorry, I just lost my place. Uh, yeah, He was also the kind of guy who always wore loud Hawaiian shirts, including to the student faculty baseball games, where he would announce loud, possibly comic, play-by-play -play calls of the game to the crowd. For instance, just as Henry sat down next to him, Dr. Vernon had yelled out, Jared Johnson hits a scorcher to short, when in fact Jared had hit a dribbler that barely made it to the pitcher's mound. It was unclear to Henry whether Dr. Vernon's commentary was supposed to be optimistic or sarcastic, but in any case, it was found by almost everyone with an earshot to be incredibly annoying. Why don't you deck him, Grace Vernon yelled, shouted to Henry. Grace was sitting several rows behind them, 
She was a home ec teacher at her school, at the school, and like so many who've had that calling, she seemed as though she'd blown in from some prairie in her long sleeved sundresses and heavy braids and her crafty ways of making a little go a long way. She was also Dr. Vernon's wife. Why don't you deck him already? She asked Henry. Why don't you? He likes it when I deck him, Grace announced. It only encourages him. Dr. Vernon turned in her direction. That's true, sweetie, he said, beaming. Then he turned back to the field and said, in response to a lazy pop fly to the first baseman, a Ruthian blast to right field, going, going, going. That was it. Grace charged down the stairs, the metal bleachers bonging and vibrating in her wake, punched her husband hard in the upper arm, and then went back to her seat, where she was greeted with cheers. Meanwhile, Dr. Vernon rubbed his arm, still beaming, encouraged. See, Grace said to everyone, and then to Henry, she said, how can you stand to sit next to that fool anyway? Stand to sit, Henry thought, but did not say. <laughs> Instead, he waited a few seconds, then leaned closer to Dr. Vernon. The urge is great among those in hiding to casually rest, test other people's knowledge of the events that necessitated their going underground in the first place. Henry had resisted the urge for so long. For the past two years, he'd resisted it so expertly that he didn't really even feel the urge anymore. But now that the stranger had shown up, Henry felt it again, more strongly than ever. Do you remember a few years ago, Henry said, whispered actually, the controversy about the Danish cartoonist Jens Bedrup? Your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries, Dr. Vernon shouted, not at Henry, but at the umpire. Because this was another thing he did at these baseball games. He insulted the umpire, Matty, by way of quotes from Money Python movies. <laughs> Matty took off his mask and looked in the direction of the insult. He smiled at Dr. Vernon, then stopped smiling and gave Henry a more complicated look, a look meant to communicate, among other things, I'm watching you, buddy. Don't forget that. And don't forget that I know your secrets, or at least I know some of your secrets, or at least I know what someone else has told me about some of your secrets, or at least I know that you have secrets, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Not that you're the only one around here with secrets, God knows. And maybe one day you and I will drink some beers and talk about them. And Jesus, that would feel good, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it feel fucking great to finally stop lying, to tell the truth? Not to everyone, just to one person. Just to have one person you can sit down next to at the bar and rip open your chest and reveal your terrible secret heart to and have that person sitting next to you at the bar not judge you or hate you for what's in that heart, for what you've done. A buddy, a true friend who will say, after you've just shown him your heart, I'm so glad you just did that. I understand. We all have our secrets. This is what makes us human. This is what makes me human. Now it's my turn. Now I'm going to rip open my chest, etc. <laughs> and so, hey, let's get those beers someday soon. Although, speaking of beers, I know that in three days you're going to be marrying Helen down at the bar, and I'm glad, or at least I'm going to act like I'm glad, because I know you make her happy, and also because the other day she told me, when I said casually, like you're marrying her didn't bother me, because it doesn't, I said, hey, don't you think you're making a horrible mistake marrying this joker? And when I said that, she told me not to be a jealous dick, that I, of all people, have no right to be a jealous dick. And so here I am, not being a jealous dick. No, this is just me being glad you're going to marry my ex-wife. But make no mistake, every time I think about you touching Ellen, even accidentally, I want to murder you. <laughs> but hey, I hope you're enjoying the baseball game. <laughs> then Matty put his mask back on <laughs> and squatted back behind the catcher. After that, neither Dr. Vernon nor Henry spoke for such a long time that Henry started to forget that he'd ever asked Dr. Vernon the question about the Danish cartoonist, the way, before the stranger had shown up, he'd almost managed to forget that he'd ever been anything but a public high school counselor in upstate New York. Okay, one more short chapter. Um, this is the guy who makes an appearance in the office uh, in the first chapter I read. His name is Soren. Uh, and there are a lot of CIA agents in this town. Uh, many of them are also, they work at the high school. <laughs> Larsen, that's a Danish name, he'd said, first in Danish and then in English. Although that was, uh, Maddie's ex-lover is someone who's basically blackmailing this guy to actually try to finish trying to kill Henry, which he does not want to do. It's a complicated, needlessly <laughs> complicated backstory. Uh, <laughs> The plan was simple. Soren would find the cartoonist, and he would kill him. The American agent had wanted Soren to kill the cartoonist with a gun, but Danes, even murderous Danes, are famously opposed to guns, and, 
and Soren said he'd rather use something else. A knife, for instance. A knife, the American agent had said. Her face was pinched as though she found the idea of using a knife to kill someone particularly distasteful. I don't know how to use a gun, Soren explained. Jesus, a knife, the American agent had said. Why don't you just hit him with a rock or something? <laughs> but where would I get a gun? Oh, I could tell you where to get a gun, the American agent had said. But could you tell me where to get a knife, Soren had asked. And the American agent had to think about it for a while before saying, you know, I'm not even sure. I guess at the knife store? In the end, Soren had purchased the knife at something called a superstore, which the bus had passed on its way into Broomville. In the superstore, you could buy enormous tubs of mayonnaise and blinking shoes for your children and lawnmowers and boxes of cereal and prescription drugs, and also, in a section right next to the other store sections, lethal weapons, including guns and also knives. The knife Soren had bought was a big bladed thing with smooth edges and a deep, deep groove. The man who, told, who sold Soren the knife seemed to think that Soren was missing an excellent opportunity. He had cocked his head in the direction of the wall, lined with mounted pistols, rifles, shotguns, and semi-automatic weapons of all kinds, and said, and asked, you sure you don't want something else? It doesn't have to be a knife. Anyway, Soren had bought the knife, placed it in its protective sleeve, and attached the sleeve to his belt, made sure it was obscured by his jacket, and then walked into the high school. The American agent had told him where to go. Just walk in the front door, she'd said, like you'd done it every day of your life. No one will stop you if you do that. Find the stairs that lead to the basement. They always put their guidance counselor in the basement. <laughs> What's a guidance counselor, Soren had wanted to know. He's the jerk you're going to kill, the American agent had said. Soren had found the cartoonist in the basement, but then he immediately began to have doubts about his mission. For instance, this guidance counselor was a white man, and the cartoonist was a white man, but other than that, they did not strongly resemble each other. He's changed his looks. Was this man the same man? Was this man even Danish? He did have a Danish name, which led Soren to make his statement, first in Danish and then in English, but this Larson didn't respond to either language. He just sat there, arms crossed, frowning, as though asking Soren, are you really gonna do this? And then the girl with the disturbing neck had walked into the room, and Soren realized that he was not really going to do this. So he'd fled out of the room, past a janitor mopping the hall floor, spy, up the stairs, <laughs> glancing nervously from side to side as he ran, looking very much like he was someone who had not entered and exited the Broomfield Junior Senior High School every day of his life. He opened the school's front door and thought the same thing so many other people exiting that building had thought before him. Freedom. And then someone pulled Soren's arms behind his back and quickly bound them with something, and then a black four-door sedan pulled up in the circular drive outside the school, and the person behind Soren's reached around him and opened the back door and pushed Soren in so that Soren fell face down on the, on the seat. Scoot over, the man said. Soren did that. The man climbed in next to him, slamming the door shut. Then the car, which smelled strongly of kitchen grease and potatoes, drove off. There were two people on the front seat. Soren could see only the back of their heads, but could tell nonetheless that the driver was a man and the passenger a woman. He turned and looked at the man sitting next to him. He was approximately Soren's age and was holding what looked to Soren like a black bag or sack. Can I put this over his head now? The man asked the people on the front seat. The driver didn't speak and would not speak, but the woman laughed. It was a dry, barking, mirthless laugh, a smoker's laugh, if Soren had ever heard one. I don't know why you need to put it on at all, the woman said. What's he going to see? Who's he going to tell? Just in case, the man said, and the woman laughed again. It made Soren's lungs hurt to hear it. Otherwise, he felt calm, maybe because the conversation was so obviously meant to scare him. Suddenly, he saw himself at his father's house. He was finally telling his father that he was the one who burned down the cartoonist's house. He pictured his father listening carefully, the look in his face making the journey from disbelief to disappointment to shame to relief if Soren told him the story of how he had not killed the cartoonist after all, that he'd only been manipulated into thinking so, and then manipulated by the American agent into going to America to kill the cartoonist for real, which he ended up not being able to do. And then, once he told these three American agents this, told them where in Skane the other American agent was uh, living, they would let him go. Soren would tell his father all this, and his father would say, don't worry, Soren, everything's going to be just fine. How had Soren not known he would say this? How had he not seen that everything really was going to be just fine? It would make me feel better, okay? The man next to Soren said, and the woman sighed. And only then did the man turn to face Soren. 
He was holding the bag with his left hand. With his right hand, he ruffled the back of his head, the way you do when you're trying to get used to a new haircut. I'm sorry, the man said. And before he put the bag over Soren's head, Soren thought he saw the man's eyes watering a little. And that ended up being the last thing that Soren ever saw. Thank you.